NPR Halloween Holidays presents the Baba Ghoulie Show. With cartoons from Watchwaddle. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Coker. And featuring tonight two of radio's most distinguished personalities, Santos Ortega and Richard Cooker, in No Grave Can Hold Me. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little as we travel tonight into the world of shadows from which no man may return. And we learn the story of one who does return. It's a story I call No Grave Can Hold Me. My story starts in a court of law where a man is on trial for his life. The courtroom is tense, for the jury is out deciding the prisoner's fate. But the prisoner himself, a tall man with glossy black hair and piercing eyes, sits calmly with his lawyer, his daughter Nora, and his son-in-law, Harry Wilson, waiting for the fateful verdict. Oh, dear, I wish Father, I think the jury is coming in now. They say it's a bad sign when the jury is out for such a short while. You need not worry, either of you. I shall be free. I certainly hope so, Randolph, but... Well, you know, you did admit you killed Clements. Because he insulted me. He called me a mountebank, a charlatan, a trickster. He called the great Randolph a faker. So he died. There they come. Oh, Father, I'm frightened. They're taking your place in the jury box now. You look awfully grim. I repeat, have no fear for me. Foreman of the jury, has the jury reached a verdict? It has, Your Honor. What is the verdict? We find the defendant guilty as charged of murder in the first degree. Oh, no, no. Who finds you guilty? The fools. They, too, think that I'm an imposter, a trickster. They shall learn different. If I die, so shall they. The prisoner will rise. Father, you stand up. The prisoner will rise. Very well. I'll stand up. So that they will recognize my face again when they see it suddenly in the night. And know that death has come to claim them. Maximilian Randolph, you have been found guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. It is the sentence of this court that you shall suffer the punishment of death on the night of June 6th at midnight. And may God have mercy on your soul. Thank you, Guard Miller. You can see him for only five minutes, Mr. Wilson. Yes, all right, Guard. Hello, Randolph. Good evening, Harry. I see that my guard, Miller, managed to get you in to see me. Yes, he did. Time is so short that... Well, I know. It is almost midnight. And at midnight, I die. But Guard Miller has become a good friend. I knew he'd arrange it. Nora and I saw the governor this afternoon. He he refused to do a thing. It does not matter. What is death but a new garment for the soul to wear? Nora's waiting outside. You said you didn't want to see her tonight. That is as I wished. You were my assistant. We were very close, you and I. And now there is a last promise. 
you must make to me. Anything, Randolph. When you receive my body, the empty husk of the great Randolph, bury it in a vault with a bronze door which faces east. A vault facing east? Yes, of course. The door must be locked with a padlock of bronze, but it must be possible to open it from the inside but without Randolph. using a key. Randolph, you... The coffin must be locked shut as well. But I must be able to open it from the inside. Randolph, sure you're not serious. I never joke. All this and one thing more. Promise. All right, I... I promise. When I am buried, beneath my head must rest a notebook bearing the names and addresses of the 12 jurymen who found me guilty, of the prosecuting attorney, and of the judge. But, but why, Randolph? So that I may know where to seek my vengeance upon them. The vengeance I have sworn, which must be executed before my soul can sleep. Oh, Randolph, that's madness. You disbelieve. So do they. But in my studies, I have learned many things. And one of them is how to reach back from behind the dark curtain of death. Hi, time is up, sir. Thank you, Miller. Goodbye, Harry. Just tell me one more thing. Is the full moon shining tonight? Yes. It's a full moon tonight. Good. And each time hereafter that it shines, one of my enemies will join me in death. And so the great Randolph went to his execution and was buried according to his instructions. After a few days, his case was forgotten. Uh, forgotten by all but Harry Wilson, his son-in-law. Well, as the first month passed and the full moon again shone in the windows of his apartment, a strange restlessness possessed Harry. Harry, what's wrong with you? No, I, I'm sorry, Nora, but tonight, the night of the full moon, I'm, I'm nervous. I, I can't help it. Oh, darling, you're not worrying about father, are you? About his threat? Yes, I am. Oh, but that's absurd. Poor father. Toward the end, I'm afraid he was suffering from delusions and he was more than just an ordinary man. He wasn't entirely sane. Harry. No, maybe not, but he was so sure of himself, so certain. And those instructions for the way he was to be buried. Oh, of course, I, I'm just being foolish. Why don't you go out and walk for a while, Harry? It'll help calm you. All right, all right, I will. You want to come along? It's a nice night. No, I think I'll stay here and read. All right, I'll be back in an hour or so, dear. And if nothing happens tonight, I'll... I'll know that Randolph is just putting on an act. A little later, another man was also walking in the moonlight of a beautiful July evening. This one was short and stout. He was strolling homeward from a small poker party with his friends when in the dark shadows cast by the trees along the edge of the park, a tall figure stepped directly into his path. Just a moment, Adam. Uh, who are you? What do you want? Just to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. Get out of my Not way. so fast, my friend. Look. A gun. Say, what is this, a hold-up? No, Adam. It is not a hold-up. Then why are you threatening me with that gun? Why have you got that scar covering your face? Because my face has changed in the months since I was executed and buried. It's rather frightening now. What are you saying? Who are you, anyway? You're beginning to recognize my voice, aren't you? You know who I am. You just don't want to admit it to yourself. A great grandfather. Whom you, as foreman of the jury, caused to be executed. Oh, no, no, that's not possible. No one could come back from the dead. No ordinary man. But the great Randolph has oh, come back. No, I don't believe it. This is a trick of some kind. And is this a trick, Adam? Is it? <laughs> 
Is it? Uh, but Toby... Uh, Hello. Hello, Nora. Is Harry there? No, he's out for a walk. Who is this? Don't you recognize my voice, Nora? Surely you heard it often enough. Father. Oh, no, it can't be. Strange how skeptical everyone is of me. Even my own daughter. Father, it is you. What do you want? I just want to tell Harry that I have claimed the first victim of my vengeance. Exactly on the stroke of midnight. The same minute when I died. Oh, no, no. And I wanted to warn him that he must do nothing to interfere with my plans. Or if he does, I shall have to add him to my list. No, Nora, you... Is the telephone here? You, you want to speak to me? Yes, Harry, just a little after 12. He said that he... Yes, he... I, I know. I heard the news. I was in the restaurant having coffee and he came over the radio. Adams, the foreman of the jury, was found strangled in front of his home. Oh, but it's impossible. And yet it was his voice, Harry. Father's voice. Oh, we've got to do something. Nora, I've got to warn the others on that list. The other jurors, Baldwin, the district attorney, and Judge Dexter. Yes, but he said if you tried to interfere... I know, but that doesn't matter. In the morning, I'm going to District Attorney Baldwin. He'll believe me. He'll have to. Oh, but Mr. Baldwin, you've got to listen to me. You've got to warn the others. You've got to give them protection. Or they'll die, just as Adams did. Winston, I'm a busy man. I have enough on my mind without having to listen to wild-eyed stories like the one you just told oh, me. Oh, but, but it's true. Randolph's instructions about the way he wanted to be buried, the notebook that I put in the coffin with him. Mere theatrical mummery. Adams was the victim of an ordinary street mugging. That's all there is to it. I have to ask you to leave. I have more important things to tend to. <laughs> Mr. Lord, you're a sensible man. You edit the biggest newspaper in this city. If you'll only print what I've told you, the authorities will have to take some action. Well, sir, my job is to print news for our readers, not ghost stories. If I ran your story, I'd be fired tomorrow. Then you don't believe me. Uh... Tell you what I will do. I'll make a story for the Sunday supplement out. Oh, that won't do any good. If it's in a Sunday supplement, people will just smile at it. When they see it, they don't know it's just a story. And I'm afraid there's no use in talking any further, Wilson. All right, I'll go to other papers. One of them will have to believe me. I don't advise it. You run a shop, don't you? Selling tricks and magic apparatus? Yes, yes, that's right. Why? Just this. Newspapers don't believe in giving free publicity, and that's obviously what you're after. Goodbye, Mr. Wilson. I'm very sorry, Mr. Wilson, but Judge Dexter is unable to see you. Oh, but, Mr., do you explain to him what it's about? How important it is? The judge said if you cared to write him a letter, he'd give the matter his consideration. Oh, that's no good. I've got to talk to him. I'm sorry. He's leaving today for his vacation, and he won't be back for a month. Perhaps he'll be able to see you then, but he simply can't see you now. None of them would listen to me, Nora. They either thought I was crazy or that I wanted publicity. They all told me to forget it. They're right, Harry. That's the only thing to do to forget it. But, Nora... Maybe we're wrong. Maybe Adam's death last night was just a coincidence. I'm sure Father had nothing to do with it. Oh, no, no, no. He telephoned you. You heard his voice? Well, I'm not sure now that I did. Maybe it was a dream, Harry. Maybe I just imagined it. So forget the whole thing. Please, Harry, for my sake, forget it. Oh, Harry, darling, it's no good just pacing up and down. Please, sit down and try to relax. I can't, Nora, I can't. Tonight's the second full moon since Randolph was executed. He'll be leaving his grave tonight, and someone else will die. But Harry, the... There ought to be a guard over the vault he's buried in. Oh, no, that wouldn't do any good if he came back to him. The dead, he wouldn't be bothered by a guard. Please, Harry, you've done the best you can. And if it is true, and you go on like this, will you be in danger, too? I don't care. 
That list, Nora. The names on it were alphabetical. And Adams, the foreman, was the first to die. What are you driving at? The second name on the list is Baldwin, the district attorney. Baldwin. Wouldn't listen to me last time, but tonight he's got to. I'm going to his home now while it's still time. <laughs> Mr. Baldwin, you are in danger tonight. I'm sure of it. Deadly danger. No, you, you mean it. I'm sure, Will. Yeah. I, I thought it was some kind of a gag before. Now I can see you fully believe everything you've said. Oh, then you, you will take precautions. At least for tonight. I've been an officer of the law for 30 years. I've been threatened by a lot of convicted murderers. But not one of them has come back to get me yet. But you don't understand. The great Randolph is different. He had powers that, that we know nothing about. Uh, perhaps, perhaps, but I doubt it. Now, Wilson, I appreciate your warning, but I can't take it seriously. Oh, really? Then you, you won't guard yourself? Uh, no more than usual. I'll lock the door presently. But I'm sure that'll keep out any ghosts who may come this way. Mr. Baldwin, please, it's almost midnight. At least let me stay with you for another hour. I'm sorry, but I'm about ready to turn in. I expect to sleep well, too. Now, you go on home, do the same. Because nobody's going to be harmed tonight by the great brand of spook. I guarantee it. Oh, no, I... I please, I wish you'd let I me stay. I couldn't think of it. Now, you can find your way out yourself, can't you? I'm sure. Yes, of course. All right, Mr. Baldwin, I won't bother you any longer. Good night, then. Good night, Wilson. Well, he's gone. I'm afraid the poor fellow needs to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> Randolph's ghost. I only hope I never have anything worse to be afraid of than I... Who's there? Who came in just now? Wilson, is that you again? No, my friend. It is not Wilson. Who are you? What the devil's the meaning of this? You don't recognize me, then? How can I? That cloak with the collar pulled up over your face. That is to spare the world a sight that should remain forever hidden within the darkness of a coffin. But my voice... Surely you recognize that. What are you talking about? Now, get out at once or I'll call for the police. It would tax their powers to arrest me. They have no authority in the world to which... I belong. No. No, it can't be. I see you have recognized me. You should have taken Wilson's warning, Baldwin. Because I'm here. The great Randout. At your service. Oh, it's impossible. That's been said of so many things, hasn't it? But I think I can convince you. No. Now, stay away. Help! Help! That won't do you any good. By the time anyone comes, you will have joined me in the world of death. Oh! down the hall. Nora, where have you been? I just went out to get the morning papers. Why? Why? It's happened again. District Attorney Baldwin has been killed. But how? Exactly the same way Mr. Adams was killed, strangled, just at midnight. Oh, no. And Nora, I think I know the truth now. What do you mean? I don't believe it was your father at all. I think it was I that killed him. I killed them both. Nora, you've got to do it. There's a full moon tonight. You've got to lock me in this apartment. Oh, but, Harry, you couldn't possibly have killed those two men. I could. I was near the scene at both times, and my, my mind, it, it wasn't clear. I don't remember doing it, but don't you see? If, if I'd been hypnotized, I wouldn't remember. But, darling, Father couldn't have hypnotized you into committing murder. It's a law of hypnosis. The, the, the subject won't do anything he knows is wrong. I know, I know that, but I can't be sure. I believe that in those few minutes I was with him, somehow Randolph impressed on my mind orders to carry out his vengeance for him. Oh, darling, I'm sure he didn't. But if you insist, I'll lock you in. All right. Well, I want you to go now. It might not be safe for you to stay with me. All right, Harry. I'll go to a movie. Got to stay locked in until after midnight. Then even if I am hypnotized, I won't be able to do any harm. 
You do understand, Nora, don't you? Oh, of course, darling. I'm sure you're wrong, but I'll do anything you say. All right, now. Lock me in. And don't you come back until after midnight. Try to get out, and I won't remember it. Or telephone. Yes. Hello. Hello, Harry. Randolph. Yes, my boy. I'm glad at least you don't say no. It's impossible. No. Where are you, Randolph? That doesn't matter. I just wanted to warn you. And don't try to interfere with my plans. But, Randolph, I thought... Hello. Hello. He hung up. That proves that I'm not the one. Then in that case... Yes. That's the only possible answer. I know now what the truth is. Oh, I've got to get out of here. Door. Oh, it's too sound. I couldn't break it down with an axe. There's no fire escape, and it's eight floors down to the street. I have it, the superintendent. I can telephone the superintendent, tell him I'm lock, locked in, and then he'll come and let me out. Judge Dexter. First, Adams died, then Baldwin. Their names were the first two on the great Adam uh, Randolph's list. Your name is third. And so you think that tonight I'm scheduled to die, huh? Yes, yes, I'm sure of it. And you say you warned Baldwin last month just before he was murdered? I did. And he laughed at me. But he died just the same. And you're seriously asking me to believe that a dead man, legally executed by the state, is walking the streets tonight seeking my life? I tell you, he telephoned me only half an hour ago. I recognized his voice. <laughs> You know, of course, that your story sounds like the ravings of an insane mind. I know it. That's why I've kept quiet this last month. I did try to convince the police, the district attorney, and all I got was laughed at. And then... Yes, and yet, uh, obviously, you're you're in earnest. I, I don't think you're crazy. I'm not. For a little while, I thought that I was the killer. You? How? I thought I was under post-hypnotic control, that Randolph had planted in my mind the impulse to kill his enemies... But that phone call proved that I was wrong. And what do you propose that we do? If we went to his tomb, perhaps, then we'd learn the truth. Well, Wilson, what do you want to open Randolph's tomb for? Don't you see? If we go there and we find Randolph is still in his coffin, then I'll know that the real murderer is my wife, Nora. I, I have the key right here. I'll have the padlock off in a minute. Well, then hurry. The moon is bright. I'd hate to have anyone see us. Yes, sir. A very strange story. A man in my position prowling around the cemetery at midnight. Oh, but we had to come, Judge. We had to make sure. Uh, yeah. There. Unlocked it. We can open the vault door now. I'm rather sorry I paid any attention to you, Wilson. But we're here now, so let's get this thing over with. Now, I'm going in first. But don't forget, I'm armed. Oh, don't worry about me. There, I've shut the door. Be safe to turn on the flashlight now. There. See? There's the coffin. That's odd. Huh? What is it, Judge? The air in here is fresh. This vault has been opened and very recently. Then it must have been opened by Randolph. Oh, nonsense. Open this coffin and I'll prove it. Here. How does it work? This catch on the side. Can be operated either from the inside or out. There we are. It's unlocked. Well, then lift the lid, man. Lift it. What? All right, I'll do it. No. There, there. There you are. Now, see? There's your precious Randolph, safe and sound, just as I expected. Quite dead. As he's supposed to be. He's still in his coffin. Yes, and that proves that he... Wilson. Shine your flashlight down on the floor. I, I just touched a body. Lying here near the wall. Body? Oh, it's Nora. 
She's dead. I don't think so. Here, give me that light. Yes. What happened? Why did you turn out the flashlight? Something knocked it out of my hand. I, I can't find it. Of course I have it, Harry. That's why you can't find it. I know. Wasn't what are you saying? It's Randolph. He's not dead. Oh, but I am, Harry. But don't let that disturb you. I want to thank you for bringing the judge here to me. Wilson, where are you? You're trying to play a trick on me? No, no, I swear. He's quite innocent, Judge Dexter. And as for Nora, she merely came to make sure I was where I'm supposed to be. Just as you did. When I spoke to her, she fainted. Wilson, get the door open. We'll get to have some light in here. It's no use, Dexter. I can see in the dark like a cat, and you can't. No. I have you now. No, Judge. Get out of here. You're going to die, Dexter. Executed. As you ordered me. Executed. Randolph, let me go. I warn you, Randolph. I've, I've got a gun. I'm going to shoot. You're too late. You're... you're uh... Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I am. Now, see if you can find the flashlight. Right. I think I've taken care of Mr. Randolph. If it was Randolph... I think I have it. Yes, here it is. Judge, Randolph's body, it's, it's still in the coffin. I rather thought it would be. Harry? Harry, is that you? Oh, no. You're not hurt? No, just my head. I I came here to see if Father... We understand, Mrs. Wilson. And then someone hit you. Yes, from yes. behind. There was someone here in the vault. I just got a glimpse of him, and then, and then he hit me. But who was it? That's what we're just about to find out. Now, let me have the flashlight, Wilson. Yes, of course. I think he fell over here. Now, yes, here he is. But who is he? He was impersonating Father, but but who is he? Well, here he's lying on his face. I'd better turn him over. Carefully now. He's still breathing. That's it. Oh, hey, it's Miller, the guard from the penitentiary. The one Randolph said he made a friend of. Yes, the one who was guarding him just before he was executed. Oh, so that's it. It was Miller. Miller. Can you hear me? What I'm afraid he's dying. Before Father was executed, he must have hypnotized this man and ordered him to carry out his fantastic scheme of vengeance. Oh, it was a trick, but it was a very cunning trick. By means of hypnosis, Randolph used this man as a tool, even though Randolph himself was dead. He must have recognized that Miller was unusually susceptible. I think we'll find that Miller was a psychotic to begin with. Otherwise, Randolph's hypnosis would never have worked. For no normal person can be influenced the way Miller was under any circumstances. Isn't there anything we can do for him? No. No, he's gone. And with him, the great Randolph has died, too. For good. <laughs> Mysterious traveler again. So the great Randolph is dead for good, is he? I wonder. After all, Miller wasn't the only guard Randolph had a chance to talk to. Oh, but he, he couldn't have hypnotized any of the others. I wouldn't give it another thought if I were you. Unless, of course, you were on the jury that convicted Randolph. In that case... It... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. The role of the mysterious traveler is played by Maurice Tarplin. In tonight's cast were Santos Ortega, Richard Coogan, Shirley Blank, and Bill Smith. Original music composed and played by Al Finelli. All characters in this story were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons was purely coincidental. This is Bob Emmerich speaking. This program came from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cartoons, usually found in your television set. Today, however, they will appear 
inside your radio. This is Watch Waddle Tunes on the Baba Ghoulie Show. And now, from the Scree Forest Archive, some classic Watch Waddle cartoons. Last one inside is a rotten egg. <laughs> mm. What? <laughs> Afternoon edition? No, nothing new. Tell her King his nemesis is out here. Now, Miss Logan, maybe you'd better drop back a little later. Cap Street's tied up on a very important case. <laughs> it's all right. An important case, huh? So the boys get a fast call. Pretty wreck the car, and when they get down there, it's just another family quarrel. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> Bill. How many times have I told you not to bust I in my office? I can tell you, Ken Bill Street. I want some news. Of course, you know Miss Bobby Logan of the Herald. Little gal gets all the medals for digging up the bodies. Check with those fingerprints, will you? Right. Well, goodbye. A polite policeman. Uh, oh, come on, Bill. Give me a story. You know I've got to have something for the afternoon edition. Everything is peaceful and quiet. I have nothing for the afternoon edition. Now, scram. But Captain, the coroner phoned. They've just taken Dan Grady to the morgue. They fished him out of the bay about an hour ago. Murdered. Oh, he's going to take this pretty hard, Mike. Sure. Him and Dan was just like brothers. Yes, I know. What makes you think they tried to hide his body, Doc? Well, in the first place, you know where it was found. Washed ashore down the bay. Lungs were collapsed. That means the body was under water pressure for some time. This was tied around the ankles. And there were deep bruises. Tied a weight on him and threw him overboard. That's right, Bill. After the bullets had done their work. Yeah. Did you get them over to ballistics? Mm-hmm. There's a closey head on. Take a look. Seaman's outfit. Andy, check these clothes and see if you can find out where he bought them. Thanks a lot, Doc. I'll check with you later about Dan. 
Good night, Del. This hits the whole department with a jolt, Bill. Hit me a little harder than the rest. Dan and I were together as kids. Took our training together. Pounded the same beat. Yes, I know. You say he was on a smuggling detail? Yes. That ought to lead us to something. Nothing unless he was following a hot trail. You know, Grady. You always prefer to work lone wolf on a case. Well, it's in my department now, Chief. It's homicide. Yes, and you have command of every resource of the department. I may need it. Because I'm going to find out who killed Grady if it's the last thing I do. I know you will, Bill. And good luck. Thanks. Gee, Bill, I'm sorry. I wish I could help. Thanks, Bobby. It's funny, but somehow I can't realize it. Does his wife know? Molly? No, not yet. Poor kid. Say, you can help me at that if you want to. Of course. Anything. Go on out to Molly's and break it to her as easy as you can. She doesn't know me very well. You're the one to tell her. Oh, it's a woman's job. Okay, Bill. I came just as soon as I heard the news. Am I glad, Wong? I sure can use you. Unfortunately, I can't call you in on this case officially. I'm more or less doing it on my own. I'll do everything I can to help. Dan Grady was my friend, too. Thanks. You know what it means to me. Well, not too fast with your thanks. You know, the only reason I've been useful in the past was because in each case, the Orient was involved. Well, Dan Grady was assigned to the smuggling detail. And smuggling in San Francisco means the Orient. Let's have a look at his office. Good. Wife and kid. You say he was working on a smuggling detail? Yes, sort of a roving commission. The reason they gave it to Dan is because he was born and raised here in San Francisco. He knew every nook and cranny. But the seaman's clothes would indicate that he was working on something with the waterfront. Yeah, but what? Whoa, look here. What is that? Why, that's a rare piece of emerald jade, as fine a specimen as I've ever seen. Carved in the fashion of the Ming Dynasty. Why, the art of that carving has been lost for hundreds of years. This piece is worth two or three thousand dollars. Really? Dan was sure working on something hot. Probably that's why he was killed. Yes, I have seen many similar in the past three months from the captured provinces. Even so, from the ruined temple of Laoji, is it not so? Torn from their settings by alien hands. Even young China would not use such methods to win its wars. Where did you obtain this? It was in the drawer of the desk of the policeman who was killed. A policeman? A good man. Can you help me? A store called Belton's is on Market Street. There, a wise man could become more wise. How do you do? I'm Mr. Belden. Something I can do for you? I'd like an appraisal on this piece. Why, certainly. Oh, a most unusual piece. The coloring is magnificent. 
but I'm afraid I can't appraise its real value. But I understood you specialized in oriental jewelry and art objects. Oh, only imitations. Uh, we haven't a piece of jewelry in the house worth over $50. I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place. So it would seem. Only then. I suggest you try Harrington's over on Kearney. They handle that class of merchandise. Thank you for your time. Not at all. I'm sorry I couldn't help you. Yeah, Chief, that's the guy, all right. I'd know that face any place. Why, that mustache. Even the checker tie. Yeah, that's him. Check a tie, huh? Yeah. Where'd you see him? On the bus going uptown. What time was it? 12 o'clock noon. 12 o'clock noon, huh? You don't say. Yeah. At that time, he'd been lying dead for three hours in the morgue. Yeah? Yeah. Why, the sworn on a stack of Bibles, that was the guy. Sure, I know, Mr. Unifer. We all make mistakes sometimes, but well, thanks for coming in anyway. Oh, not at all, Inspector, not at all. Say, maybe it was the guy's double. Yeah. You know, they say every guy's got a double. Sure. Even me. Sure. Even you. Yeah, sure. Mike, get Bobby Logan on the phone. Yes, sir. Market 6400. Hello, Bobby. I was just trying to get you on the phone. Oh, are we going someplace? Yeah, you're going someplace. If you ever pull a bright idea like that again, well, what's the matter with that? Somebody might be able to give you a lead. Somebody might be able to give me a lead. I've had every crank in San Francisco in here this afternoon. Yeah. Logan doesn't answer. Where do you think I ought to look for her? Try my office. Huh? Every one of them has seen Dan Grady in five different sections of the city at the same time. Well, but he... But nothing. Did you see that guy that just went out of here? Yes. He was on the bus today at noon with Dan. Well, that's silly. Of course it's silly. But I've had to talk to those goofs. That's what your idea's done. Wasted my whole afternoon. Yeah, Mike. A gentleman out here says he saw Detective Grady. What? Miss Logan will interview him. Well, did you hear it? Just faintly. Go on, he's your witness. Are you Mr. Lyon? Hey, yes. Well, I'm Miss Logan of the Herald. I put that picture in the paper. Oh, how do you do? Uh, well, I saw the man last night. Are you sure? Certainly. We talked for quite a while in the bar at the Club Neptune. Good afternoon, Miss Logan. I came in answer to your advertisement. Oh, now look, Mr. Wong. <laughs> <laughs> now give me the details and talk fast. Oh, hello, Wong. Did you get any information? I called on an old friend of mine in Chinatown who advised me to investigate Belden's store on Market Street. Belden's? You know, the jewelry shop. Oh, sure. I'll put a couple of men on it. Uh, no, I think I'd leave things the way they are for the time being. Bill Street, I've got him! Got who? This man did see Dan Grady. <laughs> now, look, Bobby, we've been all through that. But this man is positive. All right, if he's so positive. What was he wearing when you saw him? Well, uh, sort of like a sailor, you know. Uh, pea jacket, striped sweater. He had on dungarees. Peak cap with black patent uh, leather visor. Where'd you see him? At the Club Neptune. He, he was sitting at the bar having a drink. What time was that? About 8.30, I guess. That fits in, doesn't it, Wong? Yes, it does. Well, of course it does. Silly idea, huh? If it hadn't been for that Quiet. paper... Quiet! You're quite sure this is the man? You're absolutely certain of your identification? Oh, yes. Uh, my drink happened to tip over and spilt on him. Uh, uh, and I apologized, and we got to talking. And then what happened? Well, we talked together for a couple of minutes about football and things like that. Uh, then I left and went home. You left him at this Club Neptune? Uh, yes, he was still sitting there when I left. Well, thank you very much. You've been a great help. Is there uh, any reward connected with this? Well, you see, uh, Miss Logan takes care of that. <laughs> well, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Lyons. I'm afraid there's no reward, but... Well, I'd be very glad to mention your name in my next story of the case. Uh, did you say your first name was Homer? Uh, yes, Homer. L-Y-O-N-S. Thank you. 
too bad you haven't got a picture. Oh, I have. I, I brought one along just in case. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Lyons. Thank you. Good day. Well, Bell Street, do I get an apology or don't I? Sure, I'm gonna get the mayor to give you a key to the city. Hmm, terrific. The police thank the Herald for giving them their only clue. How's that, Mr. Wong? Not nearly strong enough. You've earned our undying gratitude. Well, I hope the information is some use to you. I'll see you later. Not me, Flatfoot. Get one of the nurses out of the receiving hospital. They don't mind a pain in the neck. Hey, you think that's a bad idea? On well, our street, just what do you know about the Club Neptune? Oh, not much, Wong. We better have dinner together. I'll take you down there later. I want to talk to this Harry Lockett. Harry Lockett? Yeah, he's the fellow that owns the Club Neptune. Hardway Harry, they call him. Hardway? Poor gambler. Yeah, gambler, smuggler, crook, everything. upstairs. The usual crowd, not much play yet. Has Tanya come in yet tonight? No. I want to see her when she comes in. Okay. You don't even know what day this is. Of course I do. It's Friday. That's why you insisted upon coming here for a fish dinner. Oh, no, it isn't. We came here because this is an anniversary. Who is it? Daniel's here. But she's got young Bellin with her. Huh. She's starting that over again, eh? Bring her in here. Okay. Listen, Tanya, I've been lying awake nights planning our future together. I, I realize that I haven't much to offer you, but I'll try awfully hard to make you happy. Oh, excuse me, Frank. I think I'd better go fix my makeup. Surely. What do you want? I thought I told you to keep away from young Belden. And I told you that my personal affairs are none of your business. What are you trying to do? Get the old man on our neck? Keep away from that boy or I'll... Or what? I guess if I'm good enough to help handle his smuggled junk, to run the risks that he cashes in on, I'm fit company for his son. Well, what about a certain other gentleman? Frank Belden wants to marry me. So? <laughs> He's got a bed, eh? Wait until his old man hears that. If you open your mouth to make trouble for that boy... So blow me down. You have really fallen for it. Maybe. Or maybe it's just the novelty of finding someone who's decent and on the level. Come on, come on, have some sense. Get the boyfriend out of here and keep him out. We're not in any spot to invite trouble, girlie. I, 
I seem to have developed a headache, Frank. Maybe it was a drink. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, maybe some fresh air would do you good. Shall we take a drive? Yes. easy to understand. The Club Neptune feels the same way, Miss Slogan. Gee whiz, I'm famous. <laughs> Who wouldn't recognize that pretty face of yours if they read the hell? I'm Harry Lockett. I'm very glad to meet you. I've heard a lot about you and your Club Neptune. So it seems, judging from today's Herald. Oh, you don't sound pleased. I'm not. I don't like that publicity. You don't? No. How about a little chat in my office? Why not? I think I'll take a look around the back. All right, I'll see you inside. You see, Miss Logan, we, uh, we don't like newspaper people around here. Hmm. I see your point. You know, if you had this place soundproof, those poker chips up there wouldn't make such a racket. <laughs> Just a little friendly advice. <laughs> Thanks. And here's some for you. I wouldn't write any more stories about the Club Neptune if I were you. Are you trying to tell me what to put in the Herald? I'm trying to tell you what you shouldn't put in the Herald. <laughs> in fact, uh, I just as soon you stay out of here. I think you'd be safer. Sometimes some people get hurt. Yeah, Dan Grady got hurt, didn't he? Hey, you sure stick out your neck, don't you, little girl? Who is it? Captain Street. What are you doing here? Mr. Lockett was just making some suggestions as to the news policy of the Herald. All right, Bobby. Well, now look here, Bill. Come Street. on, come on. Hello, Hardaway. Hello, oh, Copper. Have a drink? No, thanks. What's on your mind, Street? I suppose you read about Dan Grady. Oh, yes, yes, that's too bad. I don't think I knew him. I thought everybody on the waterfront knew Grady. <laughs> he was on the smuggling detail. It's funny you didn't run into him. I resent that, Street. I resent what happened to Dan Grady. Quit stalling, Hardway. He was in this place last night at 8.30 at your bar. Well, maybe he was. So what a lot of other people. We had a big night last night. And nobody saw Dan Grady. None of my boys did, because as soon as I saw the papers, I asked all of them. You can talk to them yourself. Maybe I will. Cigarette? Over there.
I don't pay any attention to me if I seem a little tough, Harry. Dan happened to be a pal of mine. His body washed up on the beach this morning. Been in the water for 12 hours. Kind of a tough way to go, isn't it? Well, Street, they say that drowning, it's an easy death. But Grady had two slugs in the back of his neck before he ever hit that water. That's not so easy, is it? Well, Street, if there is anything I can do for Open you... Open that I... door. Open that door. Well, hello, Street. How'd you get in there? The secret stairway in the haunted house. Secret stairway, my eye. Those stairs were there when we bought the place. But they still serve a very useful purpose. Huh? This is Hardway Harry Lockett, Mr. Wong. Oh, the Chinese copper. Precisely, Mr. Lockett. The Chinese copper. But to return to our secret stairway, I'm afraid we scared one of your callers away. Evidently, he didn't care to meet my friend, Captain Street. Seafood is our specialty, Mr. Wong. That was probably kept from the fishing barge. He saw I was busy and beat it. That very adequately describes his exit. He comes in that way because he doesn't like to go through the cafe. Close to the... Slightly fishy, Mr. Wong. Very fishy. I get this hard way. If I find out that anything happened to Grady in this place, I'm going to tear it apart. If you ever do, I'll help you. Come on, Wong. Goodbye, Mr. Lockett. Goodbye, Mr. Wong. Oh, sorry. Didn't know you were busy. Uh, he's not. Because we're just leaving. I beg your pardon, but... We've met before, haven't we, Miss, uh, Miss, uh... Sir Rover's the name, but we haven't met. I'm so sorry. Oh, now I know what prompted my mistake. I saw you sitting outside in a car with young Mr. Belden. What was he doing here? We had dinner here. Do you mind? Excuse the boys, Miss Sir Rover, but, uh, it's their business to be curious. This is Mr. Wong, the famous detective. And this is Captain Street of the San Francisco Police. Your head waiter says you found my compact. Yes, it's my desk. I'll get it for you. Drop in any time, boys. It'll be your turn to drop in on us the next time. You're a help. Why in blaze did you get rid of Belden when I told you to? Well, I did. He must have seen us outside in the parking lot. What they want? You read the papers, don't you? What do you think? I think that dead policemen are bad medicine. I don't like it, Harry. Relax. They haven't got a thing on us. So Grady was here last night. What does that prove? That the party's getting too rough for yours truly. So? <laughs> don't tell me Miss Sorova's getting jittery, eh? Sorova's getting out. Murder's something I don't want any part of. I'm through. Oh, no, you're not. When you're through, it will be because I tell you you're through. Are you threatening me? Maybe. Don't do it, Harry. I know too much. Things uh, happen to people who know too much. Yes. They end up in the bay like a certain policeman. Seafood gag of Hardways was a hot one. <laughs> and the young lady who lost her compact. More seafood, A eh, Street? I'll say. Well, what's her name? I thought I told you to scram. You're always telling me to scram. Well, you're not going to ride in a police car. Okay, let me out and I'll put on my roller skates. Oh. 
I tell you I don't like the setup. I don't like any part of it. When a dead copper spells trouble and if this girl starts to talk. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. But this idea of mine is something entirely new in radio, Mr. Forbes. Nevertheless, I'm against continuing the program. But Forbes, Belden's has had a radio program for years, and it's been excellent advertising. Not excellent enough to keep you out of the receivership. I represent the creditors, and I cannot approve the expenditure. But, Mr. Forbes, I'm sure this new idea of mine will create a lot of interest. That means customers for Belden's. I can only judge by past performance, Mr. Griswold. Results have not warranted the expense. Uh, all here? Yes. Oh, but, Mr. Forbes, this is a novelty, a complete one-act play in which I enact all the roles, male and female. You see, Mr. Forbes, impersonation is my fort. I think persistence is your fort. Well, I tell you, this is the type of program that's bound to create comment. Why not give it a chance? Uh, uh, just glance through this and you'll get the idea. After the commercial, the music fades out and you hear footsteps and a knock. Now, uh, read from there on. Pretty melodramatic, isn't it? But that's the kind of stuff they like nowadays, Mr. Forbes. The highly dramatic programs are the most successful. Suppose we try it for a couple of weeks. It wouldn't cost a fortune, and it might get results. Well, all right, we'll try it. Uh, thanks, Mr. Forbes. I'm sure you won't be sorry. We go on from 10 to 10.15 tonight. I hope you're listening in. We will. Those bills are all right. I'll see you in the morning. Hello, Frank. Hello, Mr. Forbes. How are you feeling, Dad? Oh, as well as could be expected, considering the fact that I don't have anything to say about my own business. When are you going to take me in with you? Not for a while yet. But, Dad, I've got to go to work. I've got to make some money. Isn't your allowance enough? No. I'm going to get married. Who to? That Sarova woman? Miss Sarova, yes. How did you know? I haven't taken my eyes off you completely. You've been out with that adventuress every night for a month. I wouldn't talk like that if I were you, Dad. We're both liable to be sorry for it. Besides, it won't change my decision. Frank, I won't permit you to wreck your life, to throw away your entire future for the sake of that scheming on That's enough! I'm sorry you feel that way about it, Dad, but there's nothing you can do about it. You'll never marry that woman. Do you understand? Never! Morning, Sophie. Everything chip shape? No sign of the police, if that's what you mean. Oh, why, Sophie, that's the farthest thing from my mind. Bring me the checks from last night, eh? Okay. been fooling around my desk? Me? Mm-hmm. Well, I wouldn't touch your stuff, boss. Something missing? Yeah, my gun. Gee, that ain't so good. When'd you last see it, boss? I don't know. Yesterday, I guess. I want to talk to you. Say, what are you thinking of coming down here after what's happened? I told you I'd get the stuff to you as soon as it was safe for Cap to bring it in. That isn't why I'm here. I want to know what that Sarova woman is doing running around with my son. Well, I did my best. You know, after all, it's not such a bad idea, sort of a close corporation. Are you mad? My boy has no part in all this. I went into it because it was the only hope I had of saving my business, of meeting my obligations, but not to the extent of wrecking his life, and that's what this marriage would mean. That's your problem. Right now, I have more important things to do than nurse a lovesick pup. If you value your neck, you'll do something about it. I'm warning you, Lockett. Before I see this happen to my son, I'll blast everything wide open. Including yourself? 
Including myself. Uh -huh. I see you. You like the idea of a few months on Alcatraz? I'll stop at nothing. Tanya, this is Harry. I want to apologize the way I talked to you last night. Oh, you know, I couldn't mean it. We were both a little uh, jittery and unreasonable. <laughs> now listen, Tanya, I, uh, I want to see you. I have to talk over something with you. I think you'd be interested. All right. I'll be in all evening. Goodbye. I didn't keep you waiting, Fancy. Oh, well, that's all right, so don't mention it. Oh, I'm glad of that. Who was it, sir? I haven't the least idea, but the shot came from there. Well, we'll find out who that is. Beat it out the back and left the door wide open. Whoever it was, he killed Mr. Belden. What? Oh, glory be! Get straight. Yes, sir. This case has got a million angles. If this jade matches the stuff we found in Grady's office, Belton had a fortune hidden away. And I can't understand why he was in receivership. Well, perhaps he went into this kind of business to get out of receivership. What's that receiver's name? Maybe he can help us. A man named Forbes. You know where he lives? At the town apartments. We'll go up and see him. Clancy, call my office and have young Belton picked up. Tell him to hold him while I get there. And wait for the corner. Yes, sir. Good evening, gentlemen. We want to see Mr. Forbes, John T. Forbes. Who's calling? Captain Street of the police department. Ring 22, please. Captain Street of the police department to see Mr. Forbes. Yes, sir. Go right up, Captain Street. That's number 22. Captain Street? <laughs> what on earth can he want? I wonder if I've forgotten a speed ticket. Excuse me. Pray to take my hand, will you? Okay, but it's 10 o'clock and I'll have to meet oh, Elsie. Probably won't be very long. Captain Street? That's right, and it's Mr. Wong. How do you do? How do you do? Come in here, gentlemen. Thank you. I'm afraid we interrupted your game, Mr. Ford. Oh, that's all right. Sit down, gentlemen. I've heard a great deal about you at one time or another, Mr. Wong. I'm certainly glad to meet you. Thank you. 
Well, now, gentlemen, what can I do for you? Might as well come to the point, Mr. Forbes. Frank Belden Sr., the firm for which you receiver, was found dead a half an hour ago in his store. What? Poor old Frank. I had no idea he felt so desperately about it. Of course, I knew his uh, financial affairs were in bad shape. It's not suicide, Mr. Forbes. He was murdered. Well, this certainly knocks me out. I've got to have a drink. How about you, gentlemen? Thank you, no. Well, thanks. Murdered. Who, uh, <coughs> who found him? Uh, give me more of the details. Mr. Wong found the body. Wong? Were you in the store? I was making an investigation of Belden's stock. I found this piece of jade worth at least two or three thousand dollars. And there are several more pieces, too, just as valuable. Well, I thought they carried only cheap costume jewelry. Could he have been concealing any uh, valuable assets from me? That's exactly what we wanted to find out. I'd like to go down to the store and make a complete examination of that stock. Will that be all right? I think it's a good idea. Will you, will you have a cigar, gentlemen? Yes, thanks. No, thank you. One more thing I think you should know. That jade was smuggled. And one of our own men on the smuggling detail was murdered, running it down. And the trail seems to lead to Belden's store. Why, this is the worst thing I've ever heard. Excuse me. Hello? Yeah. Here's for you. Well, thanks. Straight speaking. What? I'll go right up. There's been a shooting on the floor above. Can we get out this way? Yes. That's that Sarova girl. How do you like this? A murder right over my head. Yeah? Oh, you're the clerk. Yes, sir. I telephoned headquarters from downstairs. Thanks. What do you know about this? Uh, nothing, except what the switchboard operator told me. What'd she tell you? Well, I was sitting in the lobby when all of a sudden she started yelling, Miss Sarova's being killed. <laughs> all right, all right. Take it easy. Sit down. What did you hear on the phone? Well. I was sitting there as usual when the buzzer sounded and it was a call from 32. What time was that? About 14 after 10. That's an odd time to remember, 10, 14. Well, I'm not sure, but it was 15 after 10 when I heard the shot. And they were arguing about a minute. Who was arguing? Miss Rover and the man. Well, what were they arguing about? What'd they say? Well, he said, get away from that telephone. That's the last time you're going to pull this sort of stuff on me. And Miss Rover yelled, don't shoot, don't shoot. But he did. It's quite possible, Street. The receiver's off the stand. Yeah. Do you recognize the man's voice? No, but he was awful mad. Anybody come through that lobby that might have come up here? No, sir. Did you pass anybody on the way up? I didn't see anybody. All right, that's all for now. Stick around downstairs. Oh, hello, Doc. Prince photographs the works. And I want you to get me that... Oh, little Bo Peep, huh? What are you made up for? That's all I need! Just be sure to get everything in this corner, will you please? Hello, Bellard. What are you doing here? I thought I told you to tail hard way. I was trailing him. I lost him in the traffic at Aiton Market around 9 o'clock. I've been looking for him ever since. That's wonderful. Get my office on the phone. Get me police headquarters. Hey. Remember the last guy we saw Sir Over with? Hardway Harry. And he ditched Ballard an hour ago. That's our man. Just a minute, hold it, Mike. Hello, Mike. Hardway ditched Ballard about an hour ago. Eighth and Market. Yeah, I want you to send out a couple of men to have him. Hello. What? Hello, Hardway Harry's been sitting operator. in my office for the last hour. Operator. operator. Get it off 
the phone. Come on, get off there. Put that thing. Hello, Mike. I want you to hold Hardway. I don't care how you hold him, hold him. Bill, Bill LeMay. Will you stop? Well, then the housekeeper... Will you quit picking on me? Mr. Wong, the housekeeper saw a man sneaking up the back stairs. Sit down. I'm sorry. Uh, who are you? Uh, I'm the maid on this floor. Well, where were you in this... She was looking in the door. Will you be quiet? You say you saw a man coming up the back stairs. I finished by 10 o'clock. I was going down the back stairs when he came in. Who came in? The young man. What young man? Mr. Belden. Belden Jr. He was in the habit of using the back stairs? Sometimes. Then he had his own key. Yes, sir. That settles it. Ballard, pick up young Belden. Good idea. That's all for now, thanks. You know, Wong, Bella knew Sorova. Hardway knew her. They're all mixed up in this thing some way. I'm gonna have them all come in my office tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Up. What am I doing? <laughs> Sit down, Hardway. See who's out there, Jim. Well, how'd you do? Not bad. Have pretty good breakfast to you fellows, you know. Thanks for the cigarettes. Oh, we always take care of our guests. Who's out there? No, Jim, Cap Anderson. All right, Jim. Couple of friends of yours. Hmm. What were you doing here last night? Well, I caught one of your boys following me, and I figured he wanted to make sure what I was. So when he lost me about 9 o'clock, I decided I'd better check in. So you'd have an alibi because you knew Tanya Sorovo was going to be killed last night. What? Yeah, murdered last night. Oh, coming in here wasn't such a bad idea, was it? What time did you get here? 9.29 on the dot. Oh, got it figured out the minute, huh? Yeah, you can check with the sergeant. I know, I know. So, hello, Wong. Oh, Mr. Wong, the Chinese copper. Look here, Street, you haven't got a thing on me. I knew Sorova, sure. She used to come to my place very often. But so do a lot of other people. Including young Belden. Yes, with Sorova, yes. So what? How well did you know young Belden? Casually. How well did you know his father? Just an acquaintance. When was the last time you saw him? I saw him in my office yesterday. He came to pay his son's bar bill. And you had a little quarrel. And then you followed him down to his jewelry store and shot him. Old man Belden shot? Yeah. That's too bad. Yeah, it is too bad. He got it the same way Grady got it, in the back of the neck. What's your alibi for that? I was being trailed by one of your coppers, by good luck. What? man named Forbes is out here. He said you sent for him. All right, send him in. Wait outside, Art. Good morning, Mr. Forbes. You want to see me, Captain? Yes. You know Mr. Wong. Oh, yes. How are you, Mr. Wong? Forbes. We were kind of interrupted last night, and I'd kind of like to find out what you know about young Belden. Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you very much. Most of my dealing has been with his father. Well, what sort of a kid is he? He's always struck me as being a rather nice sort of a chap. Quiet, well brought up, and... So you don't think for a minute that he had anything to do with his father's murder? Maybe. I do know he's mixed up in Sorova's death. Oh, I can't believe that, Captain. Why, it isn't possible. I'm afraid you're wrong. There's Belden, Captain. Picked him up in a quick lunch joint, having coffee. All right, sit down. Have you met Mr. Wong? Perhaps you met him last night. Well, I've never met Mr. Wong. How do you do? We've been looking for you all night. Where were you? I don't know why the police would be interested in my movements. What's this all about? What were you doing in Tanya Sorova's apartment last night? Oh, we know you were there. The maid saw you sneaking up the back way. If I were you, I'd tell the captain all he wants to know. Well, I don't know what this is all about, Frank, but uh, you're welcome to my legal advice if I can be of any assistance to you. 
Uh, for his father's sake, I feel that I ought to do everything I can to protect him. All right. But I still want to know what you were doing in Tanya Sorova's apartment last night at 10 o'clock. Were you there, Frank? Yes, I was there, but... But I didn't kill her. She... She was dead when I found her. Don't give me that! Well, you don't know what you're saying, Frank. I demand that this boy be advised of his constitutional rights. I'll take care of his constitutional rights. This is a murder investigation. Tanya Sorova was killed last night at 10.15. Just 15 minutes after this young man was seen going in her apartment. That's not true. It's not true, I tell you. She was dead when I found her. Are you sure of the time, Street? Your own switchboard operator heard the argument and the report. They phoned Street in your study, you remember? Yes, yes, that's right. All right, Bell, an alibi out of that. Come clean. Why'd you kill her? I didn't, I didn't, I tell you. I, I love Tanya. Why would I want to kill her? I'll tell you why. Because you were jealous. You thought she was double-crossing you, and you went up to her apartment, and you quarreled, and then you killed her. That's a lie. Every word of it's a lie. So you found your sweetheart murdered, and what did you do? You ran out and hid. Why didn't you call the police? I, I don't know. I, I was half crazy. I... Now, see here, Street, this boy is no condition for questioning. I'll say he isn't, because he doesn't know the answers. Uh, gentlemen, I suggest that we all calm down and allow young Mr. Belder to tell us what happened in his own way. All right, all right. I'm listening. Now, supposing we go back just a little way, shall we? When did you last see Tanya Sorova alive? When she promised to marry me? Yesterday afternoon, late. And where was that? In her apartment. I, uh, I was going to take her to dinner, see, and, but she said she didn't feel well, so, so I went out and got a bite, and then I drove around a little while. Yes, and then? Well, on the way home, I, I saw a light in the apartment, and I, well, I went up to tell her good night. Are you in the habit of using the back way? Yeah, I had a key. See, sometimes Tanya wasn't in, and I'd go in and wait for her. Yeah, but she was in last night. Did you use the key then? No. No, that's funny. I, I remember that the door was open. Hmm? What else do you remember? Yes, Belden, go on. Well, I, I went in and called her, but there was no answer, so I went in the living room, and on the floor I saw her over by the window. Near the telephone? I don't know. I, I didn't see anything but Tanya. Was there anything else in the room that was unusual that attracted your attention? Anything at all? Yes, yeah, I remember the, the radio was on. No, oh, don't kid me. The radio wasn't playing when I got there. If you didn't leave that apartment until before 10.15, where'd you go? I don't know, I just, I, I, I drove around. I, I don't know where I went. I, I drove all night. What? Captain? A fellow out here named Griswold says he's got to see you. Who's Griswold? What does he want? What does he do? What do you want to see him about? Well, I got to talk to him. I'm from radio station LMAB. He's from radio station LMAB. I don't know anybody from a radio station. Tell him to wait. He says you got to wait. All right, come clean. You didn't leave that apartment until after 10, 15. After you killed her! Stop it, I tell you, stop it! Street, you're getting nowhere brought beating the boy this way. Maybe if you let me talk to him quietly somewhere. All right, all right, I'll talk to him quietly. Would you like to see your father? No. Why should I want to see him? <laughs> He's probably glad she's dead. Why should he be glad? Doesn't he like her? No. Did you quarrel over with your father? Yeah. Yeah, we had a quarrel and I walked out on him. And then you walked back last night to his jewelry store and shot him, killed him! You... You mean my father's dead? Stop it, will you? Stop it! What are you trying to do to me? Somebody give me a glass of water. Oh, never mind the water. Oh, I protest. Get him a glass of water. Where is it? Outside. Something wrong, Captain? Yeah, give me that brandy. Hmm. Now go and sit down. What do you want? Come on, what is this? Hey, what am I supposed to do? Spend the weekend here? He get you. Mr. Hardway. The press. Yes, the press. What do you know today? Pardon me. What's the matter? Who is this? It's the fellow from the radio station, Griswold. 
Where'd this paper file come from? Say, that looks like mine. It's missing from the desk. All right. Who did it? This is a payoff right in my own office. Stay away from that phone. Start talking hard way. What, again? Sorry for the interruption, Mr. Wong, but that is a new program, and I want to check on it. Not at all. It's all most interesting. Yes, but uh, full of headaches. Replacing Griswold is going to be one of them. I can quite imagine. His programs were popular, weren't they? Very. He was a talented young man. Wrote uh, most of the sketches and played all the parts in them. He played female roles as well? Oh, yes. In the sketch you want to see, the one he did last night, he played a very emotional feminine role. Here's the manuscript for it. Thank you. Now, this program went on the air shortly at 10 o'clock? Oh, yes. Radio works on split seconds. Every program is timed exactly. And it ran for how long? Uh, 15 minutes in all. The sketch went on at 10, one and a half and finished at 10, 14. The balance of the program time was taken up with uh, commercials that is advertising. Uh, would it disturb you if I turned on this program? Not at all. I've just finished that. I'd like to take this with me. Oh, it'll be all right. Thank you very much. You Goodbye. Goodbye. Presenting for your entertainment the first mystery thriller in their new series of programs. <laughs> How do you do, sir? Can I help you? Yes. Is this the new remote control radio? Why, yes, and a very fine instrument, too. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to give me a demonstration. I'd be glad to. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Now, uh, this is the remote control box. Hmm. Looks like the dial of an automatic telephone. And works very much on the same principle. You see, it's not attached in any way to the demonstration radio. However, being in any part of the house and desiring to change the program, we simply switch the dials and the radio automatically switches. I'll show you. California, fair Tuesday and Wednesday. Moderate temperature, light to moderate northerly wind off coast. At Northern just what California, distance would that still be effective? Guaranteed up to 200 feet. Tuesday and Wednesday. Range extreme northwest. And you can shut the radio Northern off in the same way? Valley. Oh, yes. Wind just press down on this right here. Coming suddenly and What, again? Yeah. Didn't take long for that lawyer to get you and the boys out, did it, Hardway? Why should it? Say, listen, you can't hang that murder rap on any of us. Somebody killed Griswold, and three of you were there when it happened. Yeah, and plenty others. That office of yours was a close second to a railroad station. But uh, what's this visit for? According to ballistics, the same gun killed Sarova, Belden, and Grady. Mind if I check yours? <laughs> You know I don't carry a gun. I haven't had one around here in years. Come on, search the place. You think if I had one, I would keep it here just to show? Looks like you're getting a little careless, Hardway. If that gun matches those bullets, it'll be too bad for you. Get that to ballistics. So you still think I killed Sorova while I was in your office, eh? You could have farmed that rod out. Take him away. You're making a mistake, Street. Murder is not my racket. Maybe. We'll wait and see what that ballistic report says. All right, keep your hands right there. Turn around. Ah, oh, Cap Anderson, huh? From Harry Lockett's fishing barge. 
So this is the seafood you supply this place with, huh? This is Mr. Wong, Bessie. I'll be experimenting with the phone for a little while, so pay no attention if it rings. Oh, come in, Forbes. Oh, it's you, Mr. Wong. Well, that is a relief. <laughs> I was wondering who was up here. Oh, you put that string down past my window. Yes. When I found the receiver off the stand last night, I had an idea that the switchboard operator was intended to overhear what she heard. I don't follow you. I believe that the murderer had a way of forcing her to listen at the right time. You think that a murderer would deliberately invite a witness to his crime? He might arrange to have her think she was a witness with a piece of cord, a telephone, and a radio. I don't understand. Now, this radio is a new remote control model. Now, let us assume that a certain radio program exactly fitted a given situation. How easy it would be to tune in the desired station at the right time and be nowhere near the instrument. Oh, I see. You mean that the crime could have been committed some time before? Of course. And by any of our suspects who had such cast-iron alibis. Hardway Harry Lockett, for instance, who planted himself in Street's office at the supposed time of the murder. Any of his friends. Even young Belden? Even young Belden. He was here at 10 o'clock. Who knows? Perhaps it was his second visit. You don't believe that, do you? No. Nor that any of the others did it, either. No. Is that what you were looking for, Mr. Wong? Yes. And you pulled the cord. When I went to get the drink. And when you reached for the cigars. I turned off the radio by remote control. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. Keep away from that telephone. Get over there. Mr. Forbes in? I'll see for you. Operator. Mr. Forbes doesn't answer. All right, thanks. Why don't you answer that call? Well, that's Mr. Wong. He told me not to pay no attention to it. 
Mr. Wong. Yeah, he's at Mr. Rover's apartment playing with the telephone. Well, I hope he's having a good time. I'll drop up and see him. Playing with the telephone. <laughs> Killed Grady because he was in the way. And Belden because he was getting ready to talk. Griswold when he recognized his own program. And Tanya Sorova because she knew too much. No. Because she was leaving me for a younger man. It's you who knows too much. Wong, this is Street. Just a moment, Street. What are you doing up here? Get him up. Over there with him. Well, the two of you. That makes it perfect. I suppose you'd like to have us turn around so you could give it to us in the back like you gave it to Grady. Drop that gun. Drop it, I say. Nice work, kid. Oh. Take him, Wong. Oh, Bobby. Bobby. Honey. Bobby. Yes? Oh, it's all right, Bessie. The experiment's over. You might get me the Herald, will you? Herald? You have a star reporter on your staff, a Miss Roberta Logan. She has just been instrumental in the capture of John Forbes, confessed murderer in the Dan Grady Sorova case. Oh yes, this is a scoop. This is Watch Waddle Cartoons on the Baba Ghoulie Radio Show, signing off for the evening. Well then. Huh?